No problem. So it's my pleasure to be here today to present um, and to dialogue with all of you today. Um, I am a teacher educator um, at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, and I've been in education for 20 years as an Ontario certified teacher. And I'm very much interested in literacies and um, multimodal literacies. And multi-literacies is my, my big thing. And within that is the digital is very, very heavy and present. And so I've been thinking a lot and doing a lot of uh, research on online learning. Awesome. So for those that are watching the archive, we're just going through and just doing some quick introductions about who's who in the room. And I'm Randy Levante from Candy Learn. And next on the list was uh, Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm from Edmonton Public Schools, and I'm just here to learn and listen to the discussion. Awesome. Glad for Thank you for coming. Uh, Ian. If you're still there, Ian. If not, we'll bounce back to you. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Southcombe. I work in Black Gold Schools, which is in Leduc, Niskew, Warburg, Alberta, basically. <laughs> a whole bunch of places. Um, I've been in online education for 15 years or so and blended and face to face and a whole bunch of in and out of all the worlds. Um, and yeah, right now I'm an instructional designer in our division and I run our Moodle website and all our blended and online learning courses. Great. Thanks for coming, Jen. And, and uh, she works with Terry Reed, who was one of the founders of Candy Learn as well. Uh, Lori. Hi, everybody. My name is Lori McKee. Um, I am an assistant professor at St. Francis Xavier University in Anaganesh, Nova Scotia. Um, and prior to that, I was uh, an elementary school teacher in uh, Ontario for 20 years. And so uh, my interest in this is that uh, in the pandemic, as our schools closed down, we had a responsibility, right, for our teacher uh, candidates. And how are we going to support them to all of a sudden plan um, and support their students in the elementary schools um, in this at-home learning environment? And so the digital featured into that in really interesting ways. And so I'm interested to see um, how that played out across Canada. Thanks, Laurie. And Laurie shared with us before, she's in 26 degree weather on the East Coast. And, uh, but that will change suddenly tomorrow. So then we'll have our vengeance on our jealousy. It'll be fine. <laughs> Michael, we want a weather update as well from you when we, you go. So uh, thanks, uh, Mario. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks, Randy. Yes, I saw the email this morning. I said, I'm going to register for this. I thought it was at 1 p.m. Vancouver. So uh, glad that I joined. Uh, my name is Mario from Vancouver Animation School. We uh, teach animation, effects, and video games. Uh, we have a division called Fame, which we work with K-12, a lot of districts. And that is my interest. We have pretty interesting titles. I said, you know, we got to see what's happening with, with all these schools. So thank awesome. you. Thanks for being here, Mary. I really appreciate it. Um, and Aaron, we're just doing some quick introductions. Um, just as a, a couple of things of note, if you're not in gallery view, uh, change your view to gallery as opposed to speaker, then you get to see everybody kind of all at once. That would be great. Uh, so thanks, Mario. So Maureen was next and then Michael. Okay, my name is Maureen Crawford. I work with Strategic Division Support for Edmonton Public Schools. I am on rural internet right now, which is why you don't see my picture because I may be able to stay in, in the room with you. Um, I was really involved in setting up Argyle, which is the online and home education center for Edmonton Public Schools. And we started 25 years ago. So I spent 12 years on that leadership team. So I've got a lot of sort of background in uh, online blended and home education, and now I'm working at the division level. Awesome. Maureen, did we meet when I was there in Argyle a couple of times? Yeah, I think we did. Yes, excellent. Super, thanks and well, uh, welcome. So Michael and then Ian, if you're around, we'll come back to you. Sorry, I'm playing with my lights here. <laughs> um, one of the nice things is you can get all of these little ones that you can I buy at the 99 cent store down here because I'm in California and we've got 99 cent stores. Um, I just thought it was something that they had in the movies, to be honest with you. But um, So I'm Mike Barber. I'm at uh, Troy University of California and um, I'm an associate professor here and I 
do a fair amount of research with Can -E Learn, um, mainly in a supporting role. So, um, and you'll probably hear more about that as we're going through. Great, Ian. Hi, Ian. Sorry, I'm uh, just finishing up my class here. <laughs> and so, in and out a little bit of the meeting, I'm afraid. Um, I know no video because at school we don't have uh, webcams. <laughs> so, I uh, teach high school computers and have done some distance learning stuff a lot in the past. Uh, just took over a tech facilitator role back at ADSS. And so, um, we are all face to face, but we are certainly planning for the eventuality of people being at home and supporting them at home. And so doing a lot of work in teams um, in order to facilitate that. And uh, from Port Alberni, the center of Vancouver Island where my father grew up. So um, just a, a part of that. So Rhonda and then Shanae. Hi, um, I'm from Edmonton as well. I work for Alberta Education um, and I recently transitioned back into the educational technology team. I did a secondment for two years and I was more focused on um, engagement and uh, especially student engagement. So just uh, dipping my toes back into this, but um, uh, have been living through it. My uh, youngest graduated in the spring. She was a COVID grad. So uh, interesting to think about the uh, uh, implications for um, all of these kids and how their lives have changed so dramatically. COVID grad. My son was a Y2K grad. Um, and uh, also Rhonda works with uh, Daylene Lahman, who was at Argyle before, but also has been a very strong supporter and uh, sort of a founder from Argyle days uh, with Candy Learn and also supports a lot of our research as well. So thanks. Sinead. Hi, I'm Sinead. I'm from Quebec. Um, I've been teaching online for about 12, 15 years as well, since Skype came out, whenever that was. Um, <laughs> I've, I've worked in, um, from Quebec, I've worked in British Columbia and in uh, New Brunswick and also, of course, in Quebec. Um, I support mostly homeschoolers. Um, it's a, I have a private school, uh, so we're not supported by the government, but I work with homeschoolers. So I have a huge age range from grade one all the way up to grade 12. Um, my Quebec students last year were a really small part of my business. I owned, it was only about 12 full-time students. And then over the summer that totally exploded. So I have over 300 right now and more inquiry, inquiries coming in every day. Thanks, Sinead. And Sinead just recently joined the board of Canny Learn, And I forgot to mention as well, of course, Michael and I go back from the start of Canny Learn. So you're beginning to get a sense in terms of the network around here. And I don't know why, Aaron, but you bounced up to the top, but I think Sonia uh, was, and then Aaron. Oh, you're muted still, Sonia. Okay, unmute. Okay, can you unmute and just say hi? Your, your mic was off. Hi, this is there you go. from Vancouver Animation School. I'm glad to be with you today, so. Um, awesome, welcome. And Erin, last but not least. <laughs> so I'm Erin Bowers. I'm the regional director for Canvas for K-12 in Canada. And I'm in BC, in the Kootenays. Okay, did I get everybody? Did I miss anyone? Okay, so, Joel, over to you. Before we started, um, did you want to go over the purpose of the report first? Oh, you're on mute too. <laughs> <laughs> I just see that. Michael, do you want to do you want to do a quick overview? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. Because uh, hopefully, the plan right now is that this is going to be part of a series of reports that we're working on. Um, so. The first one essentially was designed to essentially to basically catalog um, what happened or at least what the ministries had put out as what was supposed to happen in the um, spring and, and it came about because uh, the spring is when we start planning the annual state of the nation reports and it we were trying to figure out how we would essentially tell both the story of traditionally what happens with distance online and blended learning in Canada across the country, and then sort of what unexpectedly happened 
you know, in the middle of March for everyone. And our idea was to essentially produce two lots of reports. So the traditional um, State of the Nation report will still be coming December-ish when it normally uh, drops, but um, as a way to also be able to catalog what has often been termed emergency remote learning uh, that occurred, we thought that this report was a good way to do that. Uh, we're right now working on a report that hopefully will be released in the next, I'm going to say, two to four weeks uh, that will look at essentially what was planned to happen for the fall uh, when we should have returned to remote teaching as opposed to emergency remote teaching. Um, and then we're looking at a third report that will hopefully come out in early December uh, that will essentially take uh, some stories or narratives uh, vignettes from stakeholders uh, across the country, from students to parents to teachers to administrators to um, district and ministry officials that look at what actually happened on the ground as opposed to what was planned or announced to happen. Uh, so that's hopefully the, the sequence of what the three of them will be. And uh, Joelle is going to tell us essentially what we found in that first of those three. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so to just um, give an idea of what we were thinking about in terms of um, how we were going to set up um, for today. So throughout um, sharing of the data, I'll kind of pose some questions to you as a group. And um, if you would like to share something at that moment, or if you would like to just take that question and ponder it and we can wait until the end to have um, a rich discussion about what was happening, particularly at our local contexts. For, ex like for example, as Michael mentioned, um, there was a lot of things that the ministries put out there and had announced, but whether or not that is what really happened um, is why we need to have those uh, vignettes and those experiences of what happened. So if we could just start in sort of um, from the basic in terms of now we're all in remote learning and um, the jurisdictions are kind of scrambling to see like what is it that we can do to provide um, to continue to provide learning opportunities for our students. And so for most of the jurisdictions, there was this expectation of some kind of level of attendance and within that then um, it was mandatory for teachers to be checking in on students, whether it was through a digital way or calling um, and to make sure that students were um, able to participate, making sure then that they had what they needed so that they could sort of take stock of who was needing to have digital resources and those kinds of things. So as you can see here, most of the jurisdictions um, did that so that they could sort of keep tabs on um, a level of, of expected learning that was going to be going on inside um, the homes. So there were a lot of digital tools um, that were um, that the jurisdictions noted within either their press releases or um, their websites and such. So most of the jurisdictions did create a specific ministry website that they were using for their, um, their main learning um, center for both teachers, students, and parents to go to. And these ministry websites were a curation of resources and links and videos um, and documents across all um, kind of curriculum areas. A lot of the synchronous tools that were mentioned, Zoom, Google Meet, Teams, Skype, um, any kind of way. At this point, there was not any kind of um, mandate for synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning. It was left up to each local um, school board to decide um, what it was and how they wanted that to sort of be manifested in terms of getting together live with students. There were also organizational tools um, that were being used that were already set up, Google Classroom, OneNote, um, fresh grade and all of these tools were being provided to teachers 
to use with their students. And then again, the learning management systems. And so these are the ones that um, across the jurisdictions that they were mentioned. But I do know that um, at local levels, different boards already had different um, tools in place. For example, the local board here in Windsor and Ontario um, had already adopted EDSBE. So that was something that they were doing, but not necessarily something that um, other boards across the province were using. And then there were um, provinces that offered um, learning tools or courses for their teachers from um, purchasing LinkedIn learning for them to um, one jurisdiction offered a license um, to their teachers for ProQuest, which is a journal database so that they could um, do their own kind of professional learning that way from taking courses um, through university classes and such. So when we're thinking about how we were shifting towards this remote learning, um, it was really important that, um, of course, that we needed to have all of our students able to be participating in this emergency re remote learning. So these were the jurisdictions that were gathering their resources and either distributing laptops and devices to, um, to schools, um, each of the local levels were taking stock of who needed what and getting all of those um, technologies out of the schools and into the homes of students who needed it. Some places like Ontario, for example, they partnered with um, our Rogers Communication and Apple, Apple to distribute these devices, but then they also included with that free wireless data. And as you see there, that um, lasted up until the end of June. And then if they wanted to continue on, they could do so at, at a discounted rate. So there are also New Brunswick, um, laptops, iPads, some mobile internet hubs, Chromebooks were added in Nova Scotia, the Chromebooks um, priority was given to grade 10 and 12 students, particularly the grade 12 students who were um, in their last graduating year. So it was really important that if we wanted these, you know, the digital tools to work that we had to have that idea that all students have access to this. But as we know, not all students, even when um, the opportunity was to have um, devices supplemented for them, had access. So, and this is what leads us into the offline resources that were available. And this was um, very prominent in our territories and also in Nova Scotia where they partnered with a newspaper. And so that newspaper helped print the packages and helped deliver them across the province. And then Northwest Territories was partnering with the radio station which was what was able to be broadcast to our rural communities so that students that were living on the land and were outside of the area where they could um, have access to packages still had opportunities to engage in storytelling and those kinds of things. Um, as well for the Northwest Territories, um, they were listed as having, I guess, the most robust packages instead of having just um, like worksheets or, or booklets, they were also offering um, journal, you know, art supplies, all the kind of tools that students would need to be working offline. So as we are thinking about this and you're probably pondering about what, how it manifested in your own local context, so we can be thinking about um, what was sort of um, put out there by our ministries and the territories to what was being available and then to what happened at the local level. And even though some of the um, provinces might not have um, mandated as a ministry that packages were being delivered, there was certainly the ability for individual school boards to be um, putting things together to deliver for the needs of their own community. So another um, very large and important part of this, of course, is the opportunity that our teachers had or didn't have um, to prepare for 
this remote situation, this crisis situation. And obviously, I, I think, and for those of us that are, are in teaching and very close to it, um, teachers were not really prepared for taking their in-class curriculum and their in-class pedagogies and then suddenly pivoting to this online learning space. Um, it's a very different way of addressing learning needs. It's a very different pedagogy that needs to be considered. And so what was it that um, ministries were going to do to help support teachers in this? So some of the things that um, some provinces were doing, for example, in the Yukon um, as a, uh, the remote teaching toolkits, they had offers to um, have access to Teams and Google Classroom. Again, they were the ones that offered the licensing for LinkedIn and ProQuest for teachers to access and engage in their own um, professional learning. If they had time, of course, if all of us teachers know in this, it was a very stressful time. My husband's a teacher, it was very stressful. And so um, to have the time to engage in that on your own, I think would be very limited. But they also had um, professional development days, which were recorded and uploaded so that teachers could access that when they needed to. For Ontario, they offered a virtual learning environment for their teachers with access to Brightspace. Um, through this option, there were webinar, webinars and resources for teachers. Um, whether or not that was um, disseminated to teachers across the province, um, is up for debate, I think, in terms of allowing um, all of our teachers to know that these things are available to them. In Quebec, they offered um, university courses, professional web, um, webinars, they had a learn website um, specifically geared towards professional learning, and there was a lot of rich resources that were available to their teachers. And then for Nova Scotia, they had a lot of e-learning support, curriculum resources, tips, and how-to tutorials. So thinking nationally um, across that, these were really the only jurisdictions um, that made specific allowances within their um, um, delivery of remote learning that they uh, divided up specifically for teachers and their professional learning. So it's also when we think about that and how crucial teachers are in preparing curriculum and preparing learning opportunities um, in this digital, digital environment, what kinds of professional development might have been offered um, at the local level so that where, where teachers offered it through their board, where schools specifically coming together to share resources or ideas together. I think that would be a really interesting conversation because um, I don't know whether that was um, always the case for our teachers. And I think from, from what I've heard from um, teacher friends and, and other discussions that it was a very kind of stressful, lonely time for teachers in terms of how they were working through um, providing the best opportunities for their students. So it's also very important, I think, to consider um, our most vulnerable students, um, particularly our Indigenous students. A lot of students do not have access um, to the same resources that we do. And, and though there's a federal um, jurisdiction for Indigenous students, there are a lot of Indigenous students within our provinces, within our local school boards, and how then are we navigating um, those kinds of special circumstances for our most vulnerable students? And so thinking about, um, for example, in our territories, it's what, um, and Lori um, is familiar with this, it's um, thinking about our funds of knowledge. So in our northern communities, um, especially in northern Ontario, it's uh, this idea that instead of being reliant on the ministry based curriculum that we are allowing our students to be um, combining their experiences on the land or their experiences with their communities, hunting, fishing, storytelling, 
sewing, those kinds of beading, those kinds of things, and valuing and accepting those kinds of learning opportunities as what is going to um, fuel their learning during this period instead of relying again on the, the ministry created um, curriculum. So again, another um, important part to the discussion is during this time um, at our local levels, how were our most vulnerable students um, being attended to and how were we supplementing resources, either um, connecting with students if they didn't have digital technologies, how then are we connecting with our students um, in ways that we still feel or they still feel part of our, our educational community. So those were sort of um, the highlights from the research. Um, of course, if you go to the reports, each jurisdiction um, lists in detail what specific moves um, they went through in terms of um, curriculum attendance, whether their examinations were on most of the jurisdictions, if not all, they um, limited their reporting to the beginning of March and then students had the opportunity to improve, but no one was certainly um, allowed in any way to fail for that year. And as you see here, we're working towards the, the next research, which is looking at what um, the jurisdictions did as they moved into September um, with the idea that are we working towards um, a better model? Is it still remote emergency teaching or simply just remote learning um, or a blended approach? And we'll have a series of webinars um, that can go through and we can have that conversation again about these, 